symbol devotees. All glory to the symbol devotees. Hare Krishna. All glory to the symbol devotees. Hare Krishna. All glory, all glory to Shri Guru and Shri Guranga. Hare Krishna. So today we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 11, Verse 25. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this verse that we are reading has just one line purport. So we'll read this verse in unison and then I'll read the following verses and then we'll, uh, I think we'll stop at the purport for verse number 28. That's okay. So Canto 3, Chapter 11, titled Calculation of Time from the Adam, verse number 25, that's on the board. Manvantareshu manavas Tadvam shayarishaya suraha Bhavanti chayava yugapa Suresha chanu ye chata Manvantareshu manava Tadvamsha rishaya suraha Bhavanti chayava yugapa Suresha chanu ye chatan Manvantareshu manava Tadvamsha rishaya suraha Bhavanti Chayva Yugapa Suresha Chanu Ye Chatan Word for word translation. Manuantareshu. After the dissolution of each and every Manu. Manava. Other Manus. Tatvamshaya. And their descendants. Rishaya. The seven famous sages. Suraha. Devotees of the Lord. Bhavanti, flourish. Chaeva, also all of them. Yukapat, simultaneously. Suraishaha, demigods like Indra. Cha, 
and Anu followers. Ye all. Cha also. Tan them. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Shila Abhay Charan Ravinda Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada. Shila Prabhupada ki. After the dissolution of each and every Manu, the next Manu comes in order along with his descendants who rule over the different planets. But the seven famous sages and demigods like Indra and their followers such as the Gandharvas all appear simultaneously with Manu. Purport. There are 14 Manus in one day of Brahma and each of them has different descendants. So I'll read the following verses uh, and we'll, like I said, we'll stop at the purport for 28. Verse 26. Esha dainandi nashargo brahma trailokya vartana tiryan nir pitar devanam sambhavo yatrakar mabhi in the creation during Brahma's day, the three planetary systems, Swarga, Matya, and Patal, revolve, and the inhabitants, including the lower animals, human beings, demigods, and Petas, appear and disappear in terms of their fruitive activities. 27. Manvantareshu Bhagavan Bibra Tattvam Svamurti Bhi Manvad Viridam Vishwam Avati Udita Purushaha in each and every change of Manu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears by manifesting his internal potency in different incarnations as Manu and others. Thus, he maintains the universe by discovered power. Tamo matram upad, this is the verse that we'll be reading the purport for, 28. Tamo matram upadaya pratisham ruda vikrama at the end of the day, under the insignificant portion of the mode of darkness, the powerful manifestation of the universe merges in the darkness of night. By the influence of eternal time, the innumerable living entities remain merged in that dissolution and everything is silent. Purport. This verse is an explanation of the night of Brahma which is the effect of the influence of time in touch with an insignificant portion of the modes of material nature and darkness. The dissolution of the three worlds is affected by the incarnation of darkness, Rudra, represented by the fire of eternal time which blazes over the three worlds. These three worlds are known as Bhu, Bhuva and Swa, Patal, Mratya and Swarga. The innumerable living entities merge into the dissolution, which appears to be the dropping of the curtain of the scene of the Supreme Lord's energy, and, and so everything becomes silent. Like it's now silent. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun militam yena tasmai shri guru venamaha shri chetanya mano vishnam stapitam yena bhutale svayam rupa kadamayam dadati svapadantikam vandeham shri guru shri yuta padakamalam shri gurun vaishnavam scham Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Jaitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Cham He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishubhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tirubascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaivacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaham Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा 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 हरे हरे So I'll read the verse again that we read on the board, and I'll read this verse too. Uh, so 25 and 28, 25. After the dissolution of each and every Manu, the next Manu comes in order along with his descendants, who rule over the different planets by the seven famous sages and, the, and demigods like Indra and the followers, such as the Gandharvas, all appear simultaneously with Manu. And verse 28, at the end of the day, under the insignificant portion of the mode of darkness, the powerful manifestation of the universe merges in the darkness of night. By the influence of eternal time, the innumerable living entities remain merged in that dissolution, and everything is silent. So, what we've discussed here basically is change of Manus, and where we ended is what happens at the end of the day of Brahma. There's a similar verse in the Gita, if any of you remember. Chapter 8, verse number 19. Do you know what that verse says? Ishwaru? It's... Um, Bhuta grama sa evayam bhutva bhutva praliyate ratri gami vasha partha prabhavati ahar akame. Again and again, when Brahma's day arrives, all living entities come into being, and with the arrival of Brahma's night, they're helplessly annihilated. So, just for a split second, we can discuss about the Manus, and then we'll get into what's being uh, described here in this verse, in verse number 28. So, in the twelfth canto, if you refer to chapter seventeen, chapter seven, verse number fifteen, uh, the chapter is titled "Different Kinds of Puranic Literatures," and in that it's described the Manus. So, at each change of Manus during each re reign of Manu, there are six types of personalities that come about. Manu, which is the ruling Manu. So, right now, as uh, Prahlad Prabhu was describing yesterday, we are under the reign of the Vaivaspata Manu. Along with the Manu, there is there are the Sura Ishwaraha, the different Indras, the different demigods that come to rule along with him. And there are also Manu Putra, the sons of Manu, followed by Rishaya, the great sages that come with him. And to give substance and excitement to this world are the Amshavatars, the incarnation for the Supreme Lord that appear in each, uh, along with each of these Manus. So there are various, if you read Canto 8, we'll, uh, we'll see there are, you know, there are different Manvantras or there are different incarnations of Lord that appear. One of them is known as Hari, who came to rescue Gajendra. And there's also an incarnation known as Satyasen. So there are descriptions of these different Manus and what happens in each of these you know, the different incarnations of the Lord that appear along. Uh, and this has been elaborately described in the eighth canto. Now what we've just, there are different kinds of creations. One is, the, you know, the first creation is the Mahakalpa. When is Karana the Kashai Vishnu breathing out these different universes? That is described as Mahakalpa. Along with that breathing out, there are different, the Mahatattva is generated, there are different uh, ingredients for creation. That's the Mahakalpa. What follows that is the Vikalpa, the creation of Brahma and the secondary creation. So Visarga, so Vikalpa. And final is the Kalpa, the day of Brahma. That's what we are in right now. So interestingly, when I was reading this, I was drawn to Canto 12 
And in Canto 12, there's this chapter number four uh, that is described, that is titled, The Four Degrees of Universal Annihilation. And this annihilation that we've just seen that happens at the end of the day of Brahma is known as the Naimitika annihilation. At the, at the end of the day, all planets below Lord Brahma are all submerged in the water of devastation, and Brahma is going to sleep and he's having sweet dreams. <laughs> He's dreaming of Garbhoda Kashai Vishnu and getting the instruction, what am I going to do tomorrow morning when I wake up? So he's instructed by Garbhoda Kashai Vishnu and uh, now that is Naimitika. In Canto 12, this is uh, Sukadev Goswami explained to Maharaj Parikshit, there's Naimitika annihilation and there's the other one known as Prakritika annihilation, which is when two lives, when the two halves of Lord Brahma's life come to an end, then there is complete devastation. And the whole cosmic egg, you know, the whole cosmic shell is um, subject to devastation. So in that, in the purport, there's a very interesting point that, that's made. And that is that, why is Sukadev Goswami telling Maharaj Parikshit about the universal annihilation now? You know, why is he telling him that? That's because Somewhere in the mind, he's wanting to stress to Maharaj Pariksha that, look, you're about to die, but your dying is actually quite insignificant in compared to the gigantic scope of this whole material cosmos, the annihilation of the cosmos. And he's sort of comforting Sukadev goes, uh, Maharaj Pariksha that, look, it's, yeah. And a lot of times we may feel like our problems are great, but <laughs> we fail to see that there are bigger problems outside of us that we just some, some or the other can't um, you know, look at because for us, we want to be the center of attraction. So that happens. So in that sense, um, uh, Sukadev Goswami is emphasizing to Maharaj Parikshit and he describes a very, in a very systematic way how this whole cosmic annihilation basically you know, rewinds, just, you know, just disintegrates. And I'd like to read what's described there because it gives us a sense of how orderly and how structured not only creation is but also destruction can be. So what's described there is at the end of, you know, when we're approaching that time, the sun becomes so hot that it basically, it, you know, it's just, it's unbearable for anyone to be in it. It's said that even though it sucks up all of the water from the rivers and the oceans, it doesn't give back in forms of rain. So there'll be just scarcity of everything. And in that sense, all living entities would just die or just, you know, it'll, it'll be the end of it. But then after that, after this excessive heat, then there'll be rains that'll pour down and that'll pretty much submerge you know, everything below, uh, you know, just including the planet of Lord Brahma. And how does everything get, you know, presented back to Mahatattva? Canto 12, chapter 4, verse number 14. As the entire universe is flooded, the water will rob the earth of its unique quality of fragrance and the element earth, deprived of its distinguishing quality, will be dissolved. The element fire then seizes the taste from the element water, which, deprived of its unique quality taste, merges into fire. Air seizes the form inherent in fire, and then fire, deprived of form, merges into air. The element ether seizes the quality of air, namely touch, and that air enters into ether. Then, O king, false ego and ignorance seizes sound, the quality of ether, after which ether merges into false ego. False ego in the mode of passion takes hold of the senses, and false ego in the mode of goodness absorbs the demigods. Then the total mahatattva seizes false ego, 
along with its various functions, and that mahat is seized by the three basic modes of nature, goodness, passion, ignorance. My dear Parikshit, my dear King Parikshit, these modes are further overtaken by the original unmanifest form of nature, impelled by time. That unmanifest nature is not subject to the six kinds of transformation caused by the influence of time. Rather, it has no beginning and no end. It is the unmanifest, eternal, and infallible cause of creation. So, there's intelligence <laughs> behind everything. So, even when you know, the universe, when it comes into creation, we, just, we read early in the second, later half of the second canto, and then the you know, early part of the third canto, how creation happens, and destruction or annihilation just basically goes from the last, whatever was created last, and starts rescinding back, and it all uh, goes back to Mahavishnu. So what is this meant to tell us? What is this meant to show us? There are two things that'll, that are quite important here. One is that this knowledge uh, will actually humble us. You know, because like I said earlier, we, all of us, I once heard uh, Buri John Prabhu at a Japa retreat. I once heard a recording of Buri John Prabhu at a Japa retreat. And he said, and he was emphasizing this one point, he said that, each one of us is picturing ourselves or our life to be a movie. And in that movie, we picture ourselves to be the hero or the heroine. But the problem is that the next person who's right next to you is having that same picture of themselves. And they also want to be the hero and heroine. So there's a great competition, who's going to be the hero? <laughs> or the heroine. We're all competing. And we go out and say, look, I have a very important announcement to make. I am the hero of this movie. And everyone else would basically come and tell us, look, you just stay away, it's actually me. So all of this is actually meant to humble us that beyond our perception or beyond our false ego is actually this, the Supreme Lord who's controlling everything, and who is actually our well-wisher. There's a very famous uh, story, or uh, a pastor, Mashil Prabha, that was narrated by a, a Prabha disciple that I wouldn't name, you can find it out. But this, and very, you know, one of the big stalwarts, in fact, the inspiration for many of our devotees even here. This devotee said that in his early days, he was like the temple commander of, of, the, of the temple, um, Los Angeles temple. And it was quite early in the early days, and Srila Prabhupada, you know, uh, obviously this devotee was entrusted with many great responsibilities, you know, to arrange for traveling Sankirtan, you know, to arrange for different events, you know, cultivation of the different devotees there. So, you know, again, a very prominent position that was given to this devotee, and obviously this devotee just excelled, you know, just was, um, his glories are even sung, you know, it'll be sung for eternity. So he's sitting with Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada is telling him, you know what, he pointed out to the first canto of the Bhagavatam. So in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, if you see the cover, there are different universes. And he says, look, there's these different universes, and there are unlimited universes, of which, you know, three-fourths is obviously the spiritual planets, and a tiny, insignificant portion, which is one quarter of it, is the material creation. And in this material creation, you know, as goes by the breathing of uh, Mahavishnu, there are different universes that come into existence. Unlimited universes. We can't even fathom this one universe. The scientists are not even able to understand the length and breadth and the whole scope of activity that happened here. In each of these universes, there is this one planet Earth. And this universe is the smallest universe because our Brahma of this planet, of this universe, has only four heads, whereas Brahma of other planets have, you know, thousands and millions of heads. So, in this one planet, in this one universe, there's this planet Earth. And on this planet Earth, there are seven continents. And on the seven continents, there's this one country, United States of America. 
or North America, as, as they call it. And in North America, there is this city known for all kinds of activities, Los Angeles. <laughs> and in Los Angeles, there are many different suburbs. And we have this one suburb. I forget the name of the suburb. And he said in all these suburbs, there are so many, you know, it's, you know, you'll find all kinds of people and all kinds of things happening in the suburbs. And in this one suburb, there's a street, huge street, you know, or kind of, you know, just this street known as La Cienica Boulevard. And the La Cienica Boulevard, somehow or the other, you know, by great fortune, now there is this temple here, the Hare Krishna temple. And in this temple, there are so many devotees, there are so many people um, doing service. And this one person here who's been given the service is now thinking, he's so great. <laughs> and this devotee all of a sudden fell, you know, obviously in his humility, but it, it's a very sweet and uh, funny pastime, but saying how he went from all the way from here, shh, <laughs> it just humbled him. So again, this should be the effect on us as well, that we should feel humble. Oh wow, you know, there's this universe and at the end of every night, you know, it'll all be annihilated, so all our plans will be annihilated. Once I was hearing Chaitanya Charan Prabhu describe this on the same verse from the Gita, but it can be applied here as well. That in our material life, we see everything progressing on a linear scale. Right? Everything we see in our life, or, or our conditioning, or our culture that's, that's, that's ingrained in us, teaches us, or wants us to believe that everything is linear. For example, now I'm at this age, if I work hard, then at the age of 50 or whatever it is, I'll have enough resources for me to retire. I'll get a, you know, I'll, I'll buy myself a vacation home somewhere, some part of the world which <laughs> is still, you know, which I still can, and, you know, and I'll make my plans in such a way. So our mind is like that. Our mind only tells us partial reality. Our mind only tells us, you know what? I've seen this person work so hard, you know, save up, do all things that are meant to be um, aiming in that direction, which will get them to their goal. And if I do that, then I'll also, you know, get that same result. So we are forced, or we are rather conditioned by the culture, by the society, by material energy to think that everything is linear. Like I said, our mind will only tell us a partial reality, which is quite often misleading. Mind will not tell us, or our situation will not tell us, okay, but what if, you know, you catch a major disease? What if, you know, we'll, we'll think of all, all other factors as being constant, because that's what we've accustomed to seeing. But what this verse tells us and what Gita tells us is that the world is not linear, it's cyclical. Right? Everything goes in cycles. All the, major, all the seasons that we see are cyclical. The trees shed their leaves in cycles. The planets around us rotate in their you know, orbits, which is also cyclical. And if you just look at our lives itself, you know, if I see my, my elders or whoever are closer to that point of leaving their bodies, they were a child at once and now they're a second child in their old age or in their situation as of utter helplessness. They are helpless like a child because they're, they can't do certain functions which they would normally want to do. So we are a child when we are an infant and we are a child again when we are at the end of our life. So everything goes around in cycles. So what the Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam are telling us that by reading this, by really meditating on the message that's given to us by Krishna by the previous acharyas is that we change our focus from living a life not you know if we cultivate a devotional service to Krishna if we are able to serve the Vaishnavas if we are if we get the taste high taste of the holy name and 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 Shrimad Bhagavatam then we'll be able to transcend our understanding of everything being on a linear scale and move and understand that this is all cyclical. What's my supreme objective? What's my objective? What's my goal in life? So 
with this said, there is, all of this plays an important role in our Krishna consciousness. Even though this topic itself or this chapter or anything relating to do, it may sound very technical, it may sound, you know, just, okay, let me just <laughs> brush through these pages and get to, you know, the tenth canto or, you know, the, the more or pastimes that we can relate to, but this is also actually quite important and significant for us. So, as I was also reading through this pastime, or this, this um, section of the Bhagavatam, I was reminded to uh, a section from the 8th canto. Actually, it's the very first chapter of the 8th canto, where the chapter titled Description of the Future, Description of the Manus. And in that particular chapter, um, it describes Swayam Bhuva Manu, the very first Manu, and how at the end of his life he's, you know, he's done his duties, he's retiring to the forest, and he, he goes to the forest and he's wanting to meditate on the Supreme Personality of God. And in that he says, he, he sings or he chants some very beautiful prayers. And one of them, it actually was actually quite striking because it, it focuses on a similar theme that's been, that's been described here. So I'll just read that out too. Canto 8, Chapter 1, Verse Number 9. Shri Manu Ruvacha Yena Cheta Yate Vishwam Vishwam Cheta Yate Nayam Yo Jagati Sayanath Min Nayam Tam Veda Veda Sa. Read the, just hear the translation, I'll read the purport to it, it's not very long. So. Lord Manu said, The Supreme Living Being has created this material world of animation. It is not that he was created by this material world. When everything is silent, the Supreme Being stays awake as a witness. The living entity does not know him, but he knows everything. I'm just fast forwarding to the purport. According to the Vedic version, the Lord is the Supreme Eternal, the Supreme Living Being. The difference between the Supreme Being and the ordinary Living Being is that when this material world is annihilated, all the living entities remain silent in oblivion, in a dreaming or unconscious condition. Whereas the Supreme Being stays awake as the witness of everything. This material world is created, it stays for some time, and then it is annihilated. Throughout these changes, however, the Supreme Being remains awake. In the material condition of all living entities, there are three stages of dreaming. When the material world is awake and put in working order, this is a kind of dream, a waking dream. When the living entities go to sleep, they dream again. And when unconscious at the time of annihilation, when this material world is unmanifested, they enter another stage of dreaming. At any stage in the material world, they are all dreaming. In the spiritual world, however, everything is awake. So, this is spoken by Svayambhuva Manu, and he's Deciding these prayers um, in glorification of the Supreme Lord. So, yes, so the, the key here is for us to understand that this knowledge is meant to make us humble and for us to change, or for, to, for us to change our consciousness from understanding that this world around us and our lives that we think is linear is actually cyclical. And that will propel us towards uh, advancing in our Krishna consciousness. So I'll end here if anyone has any questions or comments. Yes, yeah, so like I said, for example, any person <clears throat> that you may ask, what's your plan, right? Just any, leave aside, you know, whatever age, you know, whatever it is. They'll basically think, okay, if I, because what's being projected in the media, it's just what's been projected by just the mainstream society is that 
if you just do focus on these things that are in your control, everything that's not in your control will also help you, you know, will also give in. For example, like I said earlier, if I just keep working hard, for example, most of us that are working do have that understanding or do have that expectation that we want to save for our retirement. You know, that's a very basic example. If you keep working for another 20 years, if you go to any insurance planner or any financial plan, they just say, yes, if for the next 20 years, if you just keep aside this amount of money for your, you know, for your retirement, you'll, when you finish your working, uh, when you finish your working um, career, you'll have this much. And at that time, you'll think, oh, okay, then let me, that, that means I can have enough based on whatever estimates that you, will, you may want to have. I can save myself to buy a retirement home there. I'm going to, this is the lifestyle that I'll be living. What, it, what our mind won't tell you, like I said, what if you're diagnosed with some sort of disease? What if your, you know, your family situation has changed considerably at that time? What if at that time that you're just about to retire, there's a major, you know, Hopefully not, but there is a, there's a major change to the world situation like what we're facing right now. What if, you know, there are all these scenarios that we think that are not in our control will not affect us. Um, I just remember once, um, I mean, I won't name it, but there's a very famous um, athlete. This athlete was so good that whenever he would compete, people would only compete for the second position. You know, people were only, he was so good because everything else, everything that he did was just perfect. Only, but only, but where he actually fell into was lust. And that, you know, even though as nothing deteriorated in terms of his skill, nothing deteriorated in terms of his intelligence of how to play that particular sport. There were factors outside of it which influenced him in such a way that now that person is pretty much, you know, quite, you know, is a nobody. So we, because our mind works in such a way that we don't, it doesn't want us to foresee or it just somehow the other, the illusory energy doesn't want us to see to look at all the consequences that could happen. So we just move in that direction that we think is what we can control, which is true. We just work on things that we can control, but things that we can't control, the society tells us that don't worry about them, that will also, you know, if you do the right things, things will um, fall in your favor. So that's what, like, for example, here, Sukadev goes, I mean, Parikshit Maharaj is only going to live for a hundred years of his lifetime, but Sukadev Goswami in the 12th canto is describing him what happens to Lord Brahma who lives a much considerable longer period of life than you. What happens at his, how there's a destruction of your our physical body, similarly there's a destruction of this whole universal body. And the same principle applies there too. So we, you know, even though someone who's going to live for such long is still going to have to face with that situation at the end of their life. So that's something that uh, I can probably share. If nothing else, we'll end here. Krantra Shrimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Nita Gopremanande. Srila Prabhupada ki.